Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church, everybody. Good morning to those of you who are here with us and good morning to those of you who are joining us online. Praise the Lord. We're going to start our service here now with uh, some singing and some prayer. I think we'll go ahead and sing the first song before we, uh, before we pray. Let's all stand up together, shall we? Praise the Lord. All right. Let's pray first. Let's all bow before the Lord and let's pray. Here we go. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we gather together here this morning. And, and Lord, we're here because we want to, well, fellowship with each other, but mostly we want to worship you. And we want to, before you, Lord God, bring songs of praise and prayers and, and, and offer thanksgiving to you worship and praise you. We are grateful and thankful, Lord God, that you have saved us, you have redeemed us, Lord God, and you have brought the way of salvation to us through Jesus, your only begotten Son. You are the one that we worship before, Yahweh of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, Almighty God, the Holy Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth, 
and you have made one way for us to be redeemed and reconciled to yourself through Jesus, your Son, and what you did, Lord Jesus, when you gave your life and died on the cross and received the satisfaction of the just wrath of the Father against all sin. You took it for us. And now you, by your grace, Lord God, through faith, redeem, adopt, seal, save all who have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice. And you, God, the Holy Spirit, come in to each one who is truly yours. And we rejoice and we give you thanks and prayers. Thank you, Lord God, that we can gather like this and worship you and praise you. And we thank you for all of your goodness to us. We thank you and praise you and we pray, Lord, that everything that gets said and done in here today would exalt, glorify, lift up the name of Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, here we go. Let's sing to the Lord now. Here we go. Here we go. I'll give you all my worship. I'll give you all my praise. You alone I want to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I'll give you all my worship. I'll give you all my
follow all of your ways. And I, I, that's maybe the, I don't know, but maybe the most important line in the song because it reminds us that worship, which is what the song is about, I'll give you all my worship. All of your worship includes learning God's will and in the strength that he supplies, walking in all of his ways, right? So when you worship, it's not just standing in church and singing songs, though that's an important part of it, and thank you for being here. But uh, remember that when we're not gathered together, our worship is knowing God's ways as revealed in his word and in the power of his spirit, walking in those things by his grace. Hallelujah. All right, let's sing the next one. Here we go.
Okay, so this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. And it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so, an abundant entrance be, will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship is holy. Bye. 
worship our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Okay, remain standing there if you would. And uh, if the singers that participate in this could come up here, please, that would be great. And Fanny's coming up. And what are, what's the first number? 
And like that one song said, Lord God, though, we want to walk in all of your ways. And that, that's our worship. Our worship, is to, our worship is to believe the gospel and then apply ourselves with all diligence to learning more and more of you and growing spiritually. Less and less of the world controlling us, more and more of you controlling us. That our lives may be worshipped. And then one day, one day, Lord God, we will be redeemed from this which is temporary, redeemed which, from this which is imperfect, redeemed from this temporary place, this temporary world, and we will be translated, ushered in to your presence forever, even inhabiting a new body that isn't subject to the corruption that these are. Thank you for the glory of the gospel. Thank you that the gospel is not just some religious thing to bring people together. The gospel is about heavenly, eternal, forward, future things that are greater, a greater glory than what we see now. We say glory to your name now, but we're going to be in glory, right around the glory with you one day. And we look ahead to that. We look forward to that. You have redeemed us and you leave us here in this life to prepare us for that. And you even use us to bring the message to others that they may be redeemed and share in that glory. Hallelujah. Thank you that we can be assembled here today. Thank you for the holy and sacred assembly of your children. You manifest your glory to the world in the sacred assembly of your redeemed. Help us, Lord God, to help us, Lord God, to, well, I guess do our bit. But it's you who draw people and it's you who assemble people. And we pray that in our ministry, you would use it as a testimony of your glory and your power and your salvation to show the world that you are still redeeming souls and you are still raising up disciples. Blessed be your holy name. Dear Lord God, please fill us with the knowledge of your will. Help us to not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is your good and perfect and acceptable holy will. And then give us strength, we pray, Lord God, to walk in it. Let your will be done. What would you have us to say, Lord? Amen. What would you have us to do? Yes. What do you want with our lives that you have redeemed? What do you want us to do with our time? What do you want to, us to do with our days? What do you want us to do with our minds and our mouths and our skills and our talents? all of our resources that you have blessed and given. What do you want from us, Lord? Show it to us. Reveal it to us. And give us strength as your adopted, redeemed, forgiven by grace children. Give us strength to walk in it. Show us those things which you have prepared beforehand for us to walk in and help us to fulfill those good deeds, Lord. Let our light shine before men as Jesus taught that they may see our good works and glorify you, not glorify us. Let the good works be there and let all the glory in them go to you. Amen. Just bounce right off of us and deflect to you all the glory and all the praise. That through us, in whatever way you can, that you might win more people to yourself. Lord, help us to love one another. Help us to forgive one another and bear with one another. Help us to be humble before you. Humble before you. Help us to be bowed down before you and humble before you and seeking only for your will and for your glory to be manifest in our lives. Let this be the cry of those whom you have purchased with your own blood. Blessed be your holy name. Glory to your name. We thank you, Lord God, that we could be at that street fair downtown yesterday. And that was... Yeah, that was a great encouragement for the people that were able to participate. And, you know, as, as we have in past years, you've led us, Lord, to talk to a bunch of people and 
share literature with a bunch of people. And, you know, Lord, it's not an exercise for us. It's not a thing for us to just feel good about ourselves. It's, we really want to be of service to you in spreading this marvelous word of your gospel. We're not trying to earn points with you or earn anything. We're just, we just want you to be honored and glorified and your gospel to be spread. And here we are, Lord, as a church. We pray that people would read the stuff, remember what they heard, think about the kindness and love that they were shown, even in just a short moment of contact, and draw them to yourself. If that means bringing them here to our church, we say, great, good, praise the Lord, help us to serve you in that. But, Lord, it's to you we pray that they come. Bring people to humility and repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that they might be redeemed. Help us to serve you in all things. I pray for every marriage in our church that it would be strong and God-honoring. I pray for every parent raising children that you would strengthen them to raise them in the fear and admonishment of you. I pray for every child to respect their parents, Lord God. I pray for every home to be God-honoring. I pray for every person, uh, even, you know, I pray for even single people or whatever the life status is, Lord God. I pray for people, for all of us to use our time to serve you and seek you while you may be found, yes, that we might grow. Help us in our lives to be honoring to you. That your witness remains in the earth. And, you know, we, Lord, Lord, I don't mean that to say that like you depend on us because you made it very clear you can raise up stones to worship you. If people won't worship you, you'll, you'll raise up the rocks to praise you. The trees clap their hands. But help us, Lord, who are of the faith of Abraham and have entered the new covenant through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord God, to walk in this world for what it is, the temporary, seeking that which is above, our affections set there. Lord, for anyone in our church, either people who are here today or people, Lord God, are in the church that maybe aren't here today, or people that are struggling, people that are hurting, people that are struggling in their faith, people that are struggling with some kind of a need. We pray, Lord, for a touch in their life from you of encouragement. Help us to speak. Help us to reach out. Help us to minister to one another. Help people who are in that situation themselves to go to you to run to you from where all the help is and all the wisdom is. Touch and encourage your people that we would be strong and steadfast in the faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can pray together like this too. Youth group will start back up next week. I think I said that last week. But next week at uh, 6 o'clock, we'll have youth group starting back up. I know I told you last week that Deacon Bob would be preaching today, but... Uh, I actually preached last week and left a passage of scripture kind of halfway and it was Deacon Bob himself who came to me after the service and said, hey, you know, maybe, I, it, it, he may have actually said it just like that. Hey, and, 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 and uh, do, do you want, Pastor Lou, why don't you just preach next week and finish what you're doing and then, to, so there you go. So took Deacon Bob's wisdom there and Bob, so Bob will be up here next week like to share what he's got with you. And actually, you got a little preview of it already because some of, some of what he's going to say was in that passage of Scripture that he read this morning, which is great. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, we will have the prayer time on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. Uh, we will not have Bible study this week. I'll be away. And uh, so, uh, so Thursday night will we'll remain open. Now, uh, one thing I want to announce, something that's new for us that we're going to do starting in two weeks. This is something the deacons and I have met over. Sister April has uh, met with me and, and, and gone over a lot of this as well. As she'll be very instrumental in helping us with this. Uh, we're going to try this one time. We have kind of vision, desire for this to be something that happens on a regular basis, but we're going to try to have one and then reevaluate and see how this goes. But I think it should be very simple and very good. We're going to try to incorporate from time to time a fellowship luncheon into our Sunday morning service. All right, And we think it's going to be a good thing. Uh, the first one is going to be two weeks from today on October 2nd. 
So uh, what that is, is and I, I, I just want to lay this down as the foundational thought right now. I don't want you to think of it as like one of the dinners or the picnics, which is like a separate event all by itself. We, we, the, uh, the desire for this is for the fellowship luncheon to actually be like part of the church service. So it's like, so it's like on that day, we'll have church as normal, and then as soon as we're done, we say amen, we're all going to go downstairs and have lunch. And the lunch is going to be provided, okay, so nobody has to sign up to bring anything or anything like that. All you have to do is come to church like you normally would, stay after for a bit like most of you normally do, and we'll all go downstairs and we'll have lunch together, okay? Does that sound like a good thing? A fellowship luncheon. Yes. Now, there is, there is one thing we ask of you, since this is our first time doing it, that would really help us. We want you to uh, make, if you will, like a reservation. Uh, that is only so we know how many people will stay for this. And I hope that's all of you, that you'll see this as like part of the church service that day, right? It's actually not something to invite people to. Like, like invite people to church that day and tell them we're having a fellowship luncheon afterwards, Right? That's what you do, okay? But it's not something where, like, we're all here for church and then, and then a bunch of people show up for the luncheon. Think of the luncheon as part of the church service that day. You, you got that? That's, that's the, the view we want to have. But uh, what we do want you to do is indicate, like, how many in your party. Like, I wrote Divisia 3, right? So me, Roberta, and Jonathan will be there. My daughter's away at college. So, uh, so that's, that's all you do. You see a few people have signed up in the back already. So it's not really like a sign-up sheet where you put down what you're bringing because you're not bringing anything. Don't bring stuff. Just come to church, plan to stay, invite visitors to come to church and stay for the luncheon, and uh, please indicate for us on the paper that's on the bulletin board in the foyer how many people from your family or party will stay. Okay, so that just helps us. We don't expect it to be an exact thing. You know, things could change between now and two weeks from now. And so, but as, in as much as it's possible, put your name up there and how many people are coming, which will help April especially to know uh, how much stuff to have prepared for us. Okay, all right, good thing. Praise the Lord, a little fellowship lunch. All right, hallelujah, good. Okay, uh, let's see. Do I have anything else? I, I think that it is time to invite the Sunday school kids up here. So let's have the Sunday school students come on up. We can encourage them. A little so much for your word. We thank you for these students who are coming to learn it this morning, for the teacher who is teaching it. We pray that you help them to remember it, to absorb it, to memorize it, and to make it the foundation for the rest of their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good. How are y'all doing today? Let's try that again. Well, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't try it again. Maybe the silence is an indication of how you're doing today. I don't, I don't want like, to like fake anything, but how are y'all doing today? Y'all good? Y'all right? You okay? You happy to be in church? How about y'all online? Are you happy? I mean, are you happy? Are you, look, look, we, I'm sure you have hardships in your life and difficulties in your life and challenges in your life, but guess what? God loves you. Right? God's salvation has not left you. If you have faith in Christ, it never will. From the last time we met, you're one week closer to the day that we're all going to be with him and be free from all the battles and trials and struggles of life. And you're here in a place that's comfortable and among people who love and believe all the same stuff to worship and fellowship and encourage each other. And now we get to listen to a little study from God's word. So how are y'all doing today? You good? All right. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I'm doing well, too. In case, no, nobody asked, but uh, I'm waiting. Someday I'll say that. Someday. How are you, Pastor Lou? 
Well, I'm fine, thank you. Praise the Lord. Turn to Acts chapter 24. Let's go. Acts chapter 24. Let's let the word of God liven us up a little bit here today. I sense we need a little livening up. The Holy Spirit can do that. God can do that with one bat of his eyelash. Let's do this. So in Acts chapter 24, we get to um, verse 24. And that's where we are. And I kind of just want to catch the tail end of this. I have a lot of things to say about it. And so because uh, it, it doesn't look like much on the page, but what gets said is meaty and weighty and has a lot of important content and teaching. So let's bow before God and pray again. Lord, now we've come to the time here in our time together where, Lord, our worship, our worship of you is to sit quietly and patiently and eagerly and listen to your word that you may instruct us and teach us and fill us. Correct us and rebuke us where we need that because that's what loving fathers do. Fill us and encourage us and raise us up. Inspire us. Instruct us. Lead us. Through your word. Remind us of things that we should always remember. For your glory. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you know the story from last week about how uh, the Apostle Paul uh, was before Felix now, right? Antonius Felix, the Roman governor of the Roman province, as it was known then, of Judea. And... We've reached the point where now he's going to bring in his wife, Drusilla, and he's going to listen again to the Apostle Paul talk about the things of the Lord. And I'm not going to review the whole thing, because as I said, I've got a lot of things to say here, but let me just pick up the reading in verse 22. All right? Verse 22 of Acts chapter 24. But when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way when he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. That's where we left things last week, all right? So Paul has spoken before Felix. Felix, we're told in that little section there, has some understanding of what in that day was simply known as the way, which is what we would, in our own most common vernacular, call Christianity. And uh, he kind of like sets it aside by saying, you know what, I'm going to wait. When Lysias comes down, I'll hear you again. Verse 24 then starts out with after some days. So some days have gone by. It doesn't say how many but some days have gone by, and it says, Felix, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and by the way, the idea there is that history would record that she was actually a, a convert to Judaism, so she's Jewish in that respect. That was part of the Roman way of trying to secure the loyalty of the populace in Judea, you know, was to have at least one person who was a uh, adherent to the Jewish religion in kind of the ruling family there. So Felix is married to Drusilla. Very interesting history to all of that that's actually known. These people, Felix and Drusilla, are known outside of the pages of the Bible. I'll leave that for you. So here we go. Come on, Paul. Let's go. Let's talk again. Now, he heard him, ready, concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. So this is even like a one-time thing. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanting to do the choose a favor, 
left Paul bound. And so in the next chapter, it jumps right into when Festus had come, which fast forwards ahead a little bit in time. So that's what, Lord willing, if I can get through all this today, that's what I'll talk to you about two weeks from today when we come back to Acts chapter 25. So here we are. Here you have the scene. We're told two things about this fellow Felix. We're told that he already had some knowledge of the way. He was familiar with this, this Christianity because by this time in Paul's ministry and by this time in the life of the church, the word of the gospel had made significant strides just about everywhere in what would be the known Roman world to the Roman leader. So he's familiar with this. And then we read of what Paul had said to him in the previous passage, and we're told here that uh, Felix, when he comes in with his wife, sends for Paul and hears him again. And here's what we're told. We're given a really short description of what it was that Paul shared with him. But in that short description, there are some terms that each bear out a little bit of exposition, right? Because where it says... Uh, he heard concerning the faith in Christ and where it says, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, obviously Paul reasoned thoroughly about all of those things. So we're going to talk about all of those things as well today. In a sense, we get a, you know, sometimes I come up into the pulpit and I have a little outline with me or something like that. What you're looking at basically, not that Paul carried papers around or printed out Bible verses like we're able to or anything like that, but what you're getting a look at here is Paul's outline for how he shared concerning faith in Christ. So before we even get to that little three-point outline that's so obvious right there, let's just talk about this idea that Paul was sharing about the faith in Christ, right? So the faith in Christ, he's talking about what? He's talking about the way. I don't think this is a reference to the fact that Paul simply preached the evangelistic gospel message to him. I think that Paul did preach that, but I think this goes beyond that when he talks about the faith in Christ, right? It's not just faith in Christ which brings salvation, but it's the faith in Christ and all of the implications of that 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 has in a person's life. And there are implications, right? In a sense, you could say it's twofold, right? Faith in Christ does involve that basic gospel message, which is what brings someone into the faith. But then the faith also involves what? Growth, spiritual growth and being used by the Lord in service, spiritual gifts in the body, fellowship with other believers. That is the faith. In other words, the faith starts out with a seed, which is the gospel which is preached, which when believed, sprouts up and produces a harvest of fruit. All of that is part of the faith. A person is born again, a person believes the gospel, then a person is brought into a personal relationship with God as their father, and they begin to learn the word, they begin to pray, they begin to walk closely with the Lord. And as they do, they grow. And then what happens is as they grow, the Lord entrusts to them and gives to them gifts and raises them up to do more and more in what? Building his own church and reaching out to the world with more preaching of the gospel, right? Amen. So that's, that's like kind of what I think it's getting at when it's written here that he heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So number one is the gospel part of it. And you know what that is. That's the basic part of it, right? The whole world is sinful. You know, so imagine if you would, Paul, this Jewish man who happens to also be a Roman citizen, who was himself part of this Jewish council that's accused him, but now is a preacher of the way, and is one who is a great proponent of this faith in Jesus as the Messiah, standing in front of this Roman governor and sharing with him that the entire world is sinful. And the Bible teaches us that, right? The Bible teaches that, you know, we've all broken God's commandments. The Bible teaches us that every one of us, if we humbly look 
into the righteous law and the requirements of God, we find in our own lives that we have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. We are not the friends of God or the children of God in our natural state. We are creations of God, but we are alienated from God by our trespasses and sins. And so, Felix, here's what God did. God had promised long ago that through this nation that you find yourself the governor over right now, through these, this Jewish people, God was going to raise up an anointed one, a chosen one, a Christ. And this Christ is this Jesus that I preach everywhere in the world. This Christ is this Jesus, the way that we're talking about, that is Jesus, who himself said he was the way, right? And this Jesus came and bore the just punishment and wrath of the one almighty God, the God of Israel, Yahweh of Israel, Jesus bore that justice and wrath when he died on the cross and he received in his body when he died the punishment for our sins. Listen, Felix, the punishment for your sins. I know you don't think of yourself as one of us, but this isn't about us. And that's why these people are persecuting me and want me dead. Because I go outside the Jewish nation to tell everybody in the world that this wonderful salvation is for everyone, including you, Felix. That's the foundation of the faith. Jesus died and received the punishment for your sins. He was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. And that's why they want me dead, is because I take this message that Jesus is our Messiah where God intended it to go, which was to all the nations of the world. That the way is truly the way for everyone. However, Felix... The way goes beyond just a person being born again. The way goes, just, goes beyond just a person making that initial encounter with God, let's say. That initial reconciliation to God. Their new birth. Receiving Jesus by faith and being saved. It goes on to what we would call spiritual growth. Now, Deacon Bob read to you during our worship, a passage of scripture that he is going to elaborate on. So I'm going to make a couple of passing references to this passage, but I'm not going to flesh it out because Bob's going to, he already did some of it and he's going to review it for you next week as well as dig into some more of it. But just listen again here to Second Peter chapter 1. You know, Peter starts his letter with grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I don't know if Felix said that kind of thing. I mean, this is Peter's writing. I don't know if Paul said that thing, I mean, to Felix. But that's a pretty good description, right? In other words, when somebody gets saved, it's not just punching a ticket to heaven. They receive in that reconciliation to God everything that is needed for life, the way, the way of the Christian, the faith, the faith. They receive everything that is needed for godliness. Everything that is needed is received through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given an exceeding great uh, given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine partakers of the divine nature you see that you see that partakers of the divine nature hey felix not only are we preaching the way of god but this way that you're talking about this actually enables us by the power of this god to be a partaker of his n- nature Oh, wow, that's amazing. But then he goes on, Peter says to this, talks about escaping the corruption in the world through lust. Speaking, you know, Paul is speaking to a very corrupt man at that time, as you'll see a little later in the passage. But then Peter went on to say, also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, that's as far as I'll take it for now, because I want to take away everything Bob's going to say next week. But listen. You heard those words, right? Two phrases you need to know. Giving all diligence, what does that mean? That means you pour everything of yourself into it. 
Giving all diligence is a phrase that describes, ready, a responsibility of yours. The first part of the passage says everything for godliness is given to you. But now that it's given to you, you take all the diligence of your walk, of your daily existence, and you apply it to something. And that's that second phrase, which is what? Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith. Well, wait a minute. I thought salvation was by the grace of God alone through faith in the Lord Jesus. How can you add anything? Galatians says if someone preaches another gospel, let him be a curse. That's not what he means. Right. When he says add to your faith, he's not talking about adding something to the gospel message. The gospel message is you b- believe and you're saved. Right? That doesn't, that's nothing changed. But when someone becomes a believer, they must begin, since God has poured into them by the Holy Spirit, since God has poured into them the knowledge of all these wonderful promises and all this power and everything that is needed for life and godliness, everything's been poured into them. Now you must give all diligence to what? Add, add, add to that faith all of this stuff. So Felix, so Felix, not only... Am I being persecuted because I preach this message in the synagogues to the Jewish people and to all of the Gentile people wherever I go? But when someone believes, their lives change. Their lives change as they obey that which they could never do before they were redeemed. Now they're told to give all of their diligence to build, build, Build on that faith. What are you building with? You're not building with anything carnal. You don't build with anything fleshly. You build with what He's already poured into you. You know, that's really what spiritual growth is. Do you know know that? Spiritual growth is really just seeking God and seeking God that all of the things that He's poured into you might blossom and manifest in your life. You're not seeking for some new thing. You're not going after some extra thing. You're not going after some different thing. God himself is in you. His spirit is in you. You're commanded to be filled with the spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you. You're commanded though to be filled and not to quench the spirit, not to grieve the spirit. And as you walk with the Lord, as you gather for fellowship like this, as you listen to God's word, as you go into the room yourself and shut the door and seek the Lord in secret that he may reward those openly, reward you openly. As you do this through the course of your life, perhaps imperceptibly from one day to the next, but over the long haul, over the course of time, as you do that, what are you doing? You're giving your diligence to build on the root which is your saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not building with anything of your own. You're just seeking God and everything that He's already poured in you begins to blossom. You plant a tomato plant, right? We love our Jersey tomatoes. You plant a tomato plant and it grows and eventually it produces the best tomatoes you can find anywhere. I'm a a big Jersey tomato person. Love them. Garden tomatoes. Fantastic. You ever have extra, send them my way. They won't go to waste. You don't, you don't, while the plant is growing go out and, and, and dump all kinds of other stuff all over it and, and take some glue and a staples and attach little things to it and everything else. But it does grow as it's nourished. But everything's already there. It's already there. God's designed it so it just grows. That's a picture of the Christian life. Everything was poured into you by grace, by grace, by grace when you believed but now you give your diligence to adding to that. Hey, Felix, this way, this way that I'm talking to you about, that's what it involves. That's, that's the faith, right? I'm not just talking about faith. Believe in Jesus, accept him as your Lord and personal Savior, pray this prayer, and then you're done. And that's the experience for many Christians. Show up for church every now and then when you feel like it. And that's the extent of Christianity for so many people. Do you see what we're called to? 
Do you, have, do you have any sense at all of the depth and the magnitude of what believers are called to experience in this life? Giving all diligence, everything you've got to building on your faith. Not trying to build carnally or with other stuff, but just diligently seeking the Lord that what he's already poured in you would sprout up and grow and blossom to fruition. Anybody, anybody else excited for that? Anybody else want that? Do we, re, do we live in post-Christian America where we want to make sure that we've punched our ticket to heaven but do not intrude on my life beyond that? Wow. Oh, I hope, I hope you're eager to use your life to give all diligence. But now, let's go on. Because look, now we're given this outline. How does Paul describe for Felix the faith in Christ? It, this is like a preacher's dream. This is, like, this is like a favorite passage probably for every pastor. Because you're given your three-point outline. There's even three, which for some reason is like, well, uh, Pastor MacArthur or other, there's always, there's always like three points, right? So you're given three. Here's the description of how Paul explained the faith to Felix. He reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. This is close, not exact, but very close to the way Jesus described the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus said that when the Spirit comes, what would he do? He would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Right? Now, I think when Jesus was speaking there, Jesus was speaking strictly in the evangelistic context. And that's why he emphasizes convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But Paul here, it's a slight variation because Paul is talking about the faith in, in a way that goes beyond just the gospel message to lost people and goes to the effect that it has on redeemed people. And so he speaks here of what? The uh, righteousness, self-control. What an interesting way. If you were to describe Christianity uh, let's put it this way, a little exercise. Think to yourself. If you were to describe your Christian life in three words, how would you sum it up? Luke, we don't have every word that Paul said here, but Luke, who is the human author of Acts, summarizes Paul's description of the faith with those three words. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. That's his summary of how Paul explained uh, the faith to Felix. What words would you choose? There's Paul's. There's Paul's, right? Maybe you want to. Maybe you want to think about like where your Christian life is at if it's not like described in a broad way with those terms. Well, listen. Let's talk about each one of these things. Let's talk for a minute about righteousness. I just. I, I just went through and I've got a, a bunch of like Bible verses here that I want to share with you. You ready to listen to some Bible verses? Shake your head yes, because you're getting them whether you're ready or not. Right? Here we go. Listen to this. This is beautiful, I think. Psalm 11 and verse 7 says that Yahweh is righteous. So let's lay the foundation right there. Yahweh is righteous. And it goes on to say, Yahweh is righteous he loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright, which is another way to say the righteous. Right? So God himself is righteous, loves righteousness, and only looks upon righteousness in his people. You get it? Romans chapter 3. Now that's God. Here's what Romans chapter 3 says about us. Right? There's what the Bible says about God. Here's what the Bible says about us. For as we previously charged both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. 
No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. It goes on like this. Whose mouth is full of cursing, bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Who's Paul talking about? Everyone. Jews and Gentiles. Everyone. Destruction and misery are their ways, and the way of peace they have not known There is no fear of God before their eyes. So God is righteous, and we are not. But guess what God did? Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ Jesus. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God Well, how can I do that? God is righteous and I'm not. Here's how. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. God treated Jesus' son as if Jesus had lived the sinful life that we do. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who was righteous, Jesus took the punishment due for sin that we who are sinful might receive the reward for righteousness. There you go. Now you think, Paul describes the faith by talking about righteousness. You know that righteousness is the central concept to the gospel. Righteousness is what the gospel is all about. We are unrighteous because of our sins. God is righteous and must judge sin. Jesus was perfectly righteous and fulfilled the law. Jesus received the righteousness of the law in his death so that we who are unrighteous might be justified and considered, reckoned, deemed righteous by the God who saves us. Righteousness is the, is the fundamental concept. of, of Righteousness is... The gospel is about love, it's about grace, it's about power. But the, ready for this, the fundamental transactional element of the gospel is righteousness. Righteousness is the thing that gets exchanged in the gospel. And then you become a partaker of the blessings of the new covenant. Peter, Peter wrote in his other letter, about Jesus, when he suffered, when Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to the one who judges righteously. Now listen, ready? Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, what? You know where that goes? Having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. So Felix, the faith involves Jesus receiving that penalty and us being justified and made righteous so that now we live our lives for righteousness. So righteousness becomes a practically pursued thing in the life of a believer. And don't you know that Felix starts to squirm? Maybe you start to squirm. I should start to squirm, right? But that's the life of the believer. Peter goes on to say elsewhere in one of his, in 1 Peter, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. So Felix, Christians pursue, ready? Christians, people who follow the faith, pursue righteousness to the point where the world around us begins to hate us for it. The world around us begins to resent us for it. But we still, we press on and we go. And actually, it says that you're blessed when that happens. See, we think the blessing of God is gives us money in our bank accounts. The blessing of God is provides physical health. The blessing of God provides temporal blessing after temporal blessing. The Bible describes the blessing of God as suffering for the sake of righteousness. Literally, that's what it says. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. 
And Paul's telling this stuff as he reasons about righteousness. He's saying things like this, no doubt. Listen, where, listen how John does this. You ready? This is nail the whole thing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 says, If you know that he is righteous, God, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. That's how you know someone who's been born of God, right? How you know someone who's been born of God? They practice righteousness. They do. I'm, listen, I'm reading the Bible to you today. I said, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Hey, everybody, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Don't let anyone deceive you about this. Amen. That's right. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is, just as he, God, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed, God's seed, remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, that is, seen. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The way that you're able to identify someone who is truly a child of God is the practice of their lives. You don't become a child of God. You don't earn being a child of God. You don't remain a child of God. You don't even grow as a child of God by anything that you do. Our works are filthy rags. It has nothing to do with it. But the way that you know and can recognize someone who has believed and by grace has been reconciled to God is that the practice, the practice, the practice that is the general course of their life is changed from wickedness unto practicing righteousness. Amen. And, little children, let no one deceive you. Thus Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 7. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Look at all this stuff we did in ministry. Look at all this stuff our church did. Look at all this stuff we did in service. And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I don't know you, but I never knew you to begin with. I never knew you. Depart from me. What? This is the key to it all. You who practice lawlessness. Right? Can you see Paul sharing this kind of thing with Felix? Felix, here's what the faith is. We are all wicked and unrighteous, but the righteous one gave his life for our sins and rose from the dead. And so now we have been justified and made righteous in his blood. And now we give all the diligence and all the priority of the strength of our lives to building on that faith to the point where the practice of our lives changes from what it was before I knew him into something that honors and glorifies him. Not perfect. As well, look at your body, look at your arms, everyone, look at your arms, look at your feet, look at, look at whatever, look at a mirror. As long as you inhabit this shell, right. you're not going to experience this to perfection. That's not the point. He's talking about the practice, the practice, the practice. The practice is the general course of your life. There are actually Christians who argue against this. How can you, when the Bible screams out, don't let anyone deceive you? The how can we not think that the course of a Christian's life changes when they've gone? Do you, do you know someone who's able to become a Christian and be the same person they used to be? Is God that inept? Do you view God so lowly? Do you despise the power of God so much that you believe that someone can encounter? Moses goes up on the mountain just to listen to him and when he comes down, they have to put a cover over his head because he's glowing and they can't look at him. That was 40 days. You can walk for 40 years with him 
And your life's no different. Of course the practice of our lives changes. And you can see Paul reasoning with Felix about that. Right? Right? What's the second thing in the little outline there? Self-control. So he tells him about righteousness. Then he tells him about self-control. And, you know, that passage that in 2 Peter that I read to you before, when he says, add to your faith, you heard Bob read it before, you'll hear him do it again next week. Self-control is on that list. It's one of the building blocks. It's one of the things that you give all diligence to add to your faith. You build on your faith. You add these things that God's already put in you. Guess what? The capacity for self-control is in you from God if you're God's child. But you have to be diligent and pursue Him and seek it. And then He brings it out. Vines have branches. Those branches are affixed to the vine. They get their nourishment and everything they need through the vine and then they produce fruit. But if that branch is disconnected from the vine, it's not good for anything. It has no life in it. If you're in Christ, you're a branch in the vine. He's the vine. We're the branches. You know this, right? And so everything that you need to be a fruitful branch is already in you because you're connected to the vine. But as you walk diligently and give all your diligence to seeking Him and walking with Him, He will will be encouraged, Christian. Be encouraged. Look, you step back and consider for a minute what the, what the thrust of the things that we're saying is here. When Paul got before Felix, this is the stuff that he talked about. He reasoned with him about self-control. Why? Because that's part of the faith. And that's one of those things. That's one of those things that will blossom in the life of a Christian, if you give all diligence. I'm not going to read Second Peter again. I'm just going to leave it for Deacon Bob now. All right? Bob, you come back to that actually, right, brother? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, there you go. I like it. I can get used to this. It's like passing things off. Good. Well, self-control is also a fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? That's what I mean when I say it's already in you. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit... And he lives all these things. That's the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things, right? Self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. That is to say, it's not you just employing psychological methods or your willpower or your physical strength or whatever. It's in you. Self-control comes up, wells up, manifests as you are filled with the Spirit of God. You study his word. You meditate on his word. You listen to his word. You pursue spiritual things. You pray and you pray and you pray some more. You let God teach you. You let God lead you. And he will build up in you self-control. And self-control extends into like a bunch of areas of your life. Paul talks about the physical body. He says, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, Uh, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. You say, who can do that? Well, in the Holy Spirit, as you seek the Lord and pursue the Lord, the Lord can bring up in you as fruit on the vine's branch, can bring up in you that self-control. You be diligent, diligent, diligent to pursue it from the Lord. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Paul speaks of his physical, his corrupt physical body, his temporary physical body as being, even it is subject to his, even it is subject to the faith. That's right. Right? That's right. Amen. Get this, it goes deeper. It actually goes deeper. You ready for this? James tells us, if anyone among you thinks he's religious... What? Who said that? Scott, of course. (laughs) God bless you, Brother Scott. Hallelujah. James, what is it? James what? One what? Do you know? Yes! James 126. Hallelujah. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Right? So self-control even goes to 
not just the body, but to your mouth. Being a loose cannon is not permitted in the kingdom of God. We jo- we're loose with our mouths, and then we joke about it like it's funny. Yeah, you know me, right? Whatever. I'm, you know, the, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you point out and all the fingers are pointing back at you. Because I get, I, get, I get a little loose with my talk, but I'm convicted as I say this because as I pursue all diligence, with all diligence adding to my faith, I want self-control to well up so that what I type, what I text, what I speak is subject to myself. Subject to what God is doing in me. Self-control. Self-control is your body. Self-control is your mouth. You ready for this? Self-control. Here's the hardest one of all. Self-control is your mind. Did you know that? You know what Paul said to the Philippian church? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate. Think on these things. Paul actually told people what to think. In today's day and age, the satanic, sinful world tries to tell us what to think. And people, even Christians, subject themselves to buying into it. Right? I'm not a she, I prefer to be called a he. And if you don't go along with that, you get beaten down. And you get mocked and even threatened by it, right? So, we'll cower to the world that tries to tell us what to think. As if, the, as if it can, which it can't. Your conscience and your mind are shared space between you and Almighty Yahweh. And you are told in the Bible what to think. Listen, self-control is one of the things you add to your faith because it's already in there. You build on it. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit and self-control extends to the body, to the mouth, and to the mind and to everything else. Well, I don't know about you, but I can feel old Felix squirming even some more. You know why? When you read on to this passage, what does it say? Felix... Felix is one of these guys who like, and you meet him, and it breaks my heart because I meet him like when we go to street fairs and stuff. You meet someone and you talk to them a little bit and they're interested and you say a few words and you're just trying to, you know, graciously invite them to consider what's in the literature, tell them about the church a little bit, and they'll be like, I'm okay with God. And, And, you know... You pray that that's true, the person really is a Christian, but you know, you just get the sense from some of the things that they say in the conversation that you know that they're not. And so it like, it like breaks your heart a little bit, you know, when someone says, I'm okay with God, when you suspect that they aren't really. Felix is one of those guys who has knowledge of the way, right? Felix is a guy who calls for Paul brings his wife Drusilla in and calls for Paul. What's he expecting? He's expecting that Paul will offer him a bribe. In secular history, Tony Felix, which is what his name is, um, Antonio, Antonius Felix, he, he, in secular history, was known for someone, uh, known as someone routinely to take bribes. Josephus writes about it, everything. He was known for this. So he wants Paul to bribe him so he can let him go. That's all he's interested in. But he's able to play the religious hypocrite. Oh, I know. Look, look, my wife is Jewish. Oh, look. Yeah, you get that sometimes. You try to witness to someone and they're like, oh, I'm this, I'm that, you know. Hey, Paul, when you come back, guess what? I'm going to bring my Jewish wife in with me so you can see that I'm religious. Right? And your heart breaks for that. Your heart breaks when people play that. Right? But that's really what he is. He's looking for a bribe. He's looking for a bribe. So don't you know he's squirming a little bit because Paul has shared with him about righteousness. Righteousness is a daunting concept even for a Christian who diligently seeks the Lord for years and years and years. Imagine for Felix. Then he reasons about self-control. 
which is an outward manifestation of the reality of the faith in someone. So now he's squirming even more. Guess what Paul's about to pull out of his pocket? You're accountable. You're accountable. You're going to be judged. Hey, listen, everyone here in the room, everybody watching this online, I love you. I love you. I love you. You're accountable to God. If you're in Christ, your sins have been forever dealt with. And so you need not fear. You need not worry. You need not have one shred of an inkling of anxiety over where you're going to spend all eternity. You will be with the Lord forever. But even so, you are still accountable to our Lord who redeemed us. How so, Lou? I'm glad you asked. Listen. Well, first of all, let's build up to it. I have, in my own personal reading, been going through Isaiah. And uh, I read through it very quickly a few months ago, and now I'm going through it very slowly. But right at the end of the book, Isaiah 66, which is looking ahead to the future when Messiah returns, comes a second time. Isaiah, there's 66 chapters in Isaiah. This is the end of the book. Isaiah 66, 15 says this. Behold, Yahweh will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, Yahweh will judge all flesh. See, he's not, he's not talking there about when the Babylonians are going to come and take Judah away. That is one of the big subjects in Isaiah's sweeping, sweeping description of judgment of the world. But here he's talking about the whole world, all flesh. Yahweh will judge all flesh. And ready for this? And the slain of Yahweh will be many. When Yahweh judges, many will die. I love you. But you ought to know that about God. He's going to judge everyone. Revelation, let's get a little New Testament language here. Revelation 20 puts it like this. Apostle John, seeing these things, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. No one will escape judgment. There will be nowhere to hide. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened. Now let me explain those books. The books, plural, most likely is a reference to the works of all people who have ever lived. And then another book was opened. What's that? Another book is opened, we're told, which is the book of life. And after going through all the books and reading all the works of all the people of the world who ever lived small and great, and reading of all of the violations of God's holy laws, Another book is open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. Nobody escapes. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades itself cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation wasn't written yet when Paul stood before Felix, but Paul no doubt had some understanding of these things. Amen. And Paul is reasoning with Felix about judgment. Paul knew something about judgment when he wrote to Timothy. What did he say to Timothy? He said, well, a lot of things, but he said this. When he's talking about the word, you know, he's talking about the scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. 
profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for, good, for every good work. Therefore, here's the conclusion that he draws from that. That was 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Here's uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1. Therefore, I charge you, Paul says to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word. In other words, he draws upon the fact that Jesus is coming to judge everyone in telling Timothy, you preach every word of Scripture. Amen. When Paul preached to the Athenians, just back in chapter 17, he said, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Speaking to the Gentile, Greek, Athenian philosophers at the Areopagus in Athens. He commands all men everywhere to repent because, why? Ready? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By, how is he going to judge the world? What's his standard? What is the, this, this is the standard of God's judgment. What is the measuring stick? It's not a thing. It's a person. Hallelujah. It's a person. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given us assurance of this by what? Raising him from the dead. Amen. Judgment is coming, Felix. And everyone is going to be judged by where they stand before Jesus, the Messiah. And all Felix is thinking about is what? When is this guy going to shut up and offer me his money? And at some point, Felix realizes he's not going to shut up. He's going to keep talking and talking. And he starts to squirm. Can I tell you something? Squirming is good. Squirming is good in the light of these things. By the way, Christians, just so you know, we're not in any of that judgment. Hallelujah. We escape all of that judgment. But we have a judgment. Do you know that? We have a judgment, but it's a different judgment. Hallelujah that it's a different judgment. Because nobody survives that judgment. We have a different judgment. See, Jesus is the measuring stick. If you're in Christ, you're saved. If you're in Jesus, you're saved. But now this is your judgment. Romans 14. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5. We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's the judgment of Christians. That's not a judgment of heaven or hell. That's a judgment of eternal reward. Do you know that? Do you know that by God's grace? This is why you must give all diligence to adding to your faith. You must realize that your faith began at the cross. It didn't end there. Your sinful life and your destiny of hell ended at the cross. But your life, the faith, began when you believed. And now you must give all diligence because we will be judged according to what we have done. And what a great... Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? God saved us from our sins by giving Jesus for us. All by His grace we are saved. And now on top of that, there's reward? Hallelujah. Like not going to hell. That's pretty good reward enough, isn't it? Amen. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than, than dwell in tents of wickedness. But on top of it all, there's crowns. There's crowns that you get to take and cast at his feet. Amen. There's rewards. There's rule. He, te he teaches a parable where the faithful servants are said, you be in charge of five cities. You be in charge of ten cities. Don't you get it, Christian? This life is nothing compared to what's coming. Yeah. We're going to rule and reign with him forever. And some of us are going to rule over quasi nations in some way that I don't understand. 
And we get all wrapped up and bent out of shape about the smallest things in this life. I'm speaking to you of a Christ who wants you to give all diligence to growing because he's growing you up and he's training you and he's building you up to live and serve with him forever. Oh. Mm. Hallelujah. Well, as usual, I've reached the end of my time and I have more to say. So I don't know what to do. I guess I'm going to have to save this. Bob, you're preaching next week, no matter what. And, uh, all right? But here, look, when I come back in two weeks, here's what I got to talk to you about. Here's what I got. I got to talk to you about the response. There are... In the parable of the sower, what are we taught about? We're taught about how the Word of God affects hearers. And there's four examples, Right? Three of the examples deal with people who don't truly believe. Falls by the wayside, grows up among the thorns, and uh, uh, it grows up in his, uh, the, the, the stony ground. The birds of the air eat up the stuff by the wayside. The stony ground, it grows up, and the, the, the sun scorches it. It grows up among the thorns, produces no fruit. All examples of people who don't really believe the word of God. There are multiple examples and multiple reasons why people reject it. Felix's reason was, what? He was corrupt and he had no real interest in God's word. He just wanted to be a bride. He just wanted to be a bride. He feigned interest. Brought his Jewish wife in to show that he was religious. But all he wanted was a bride. False. Not a true believer. There is one example in Jesus' parable of a true believer, and it's someone who believes and produces fruit. Amen. Amen. So there are all kinds of reasons that people give for rejecting the gospel, but only one true thing happens when someone truly believes the gospel. They are saved, they are reconciled to God, and they begin to diligently add to their faith, and they produce fruit with their lives. Every single one. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold, but every single one. I think when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, recorded in John chapter 3? Towards the end of that discourse, Jesus says this, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's Felix. Didn't want to come to the light because it was going to interfere with what he wanted to be. But the true believer, what? He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen. Fruit. Amen. Fruit. That what he has done has been done in God, not in himself. In God, in God, in me. Amen? Amen. Two weeks, I'll come back. To, I'll be here next Sunday. I'm going to sing and all that other stuff. Bob's going to preach. But in two weeks, I'll be back here. And on the day of our fellowship luncheon, I'm going to share with you some accounts of how people responded to the gospel as recorded in the book of Acts mostly, right? We'll do a little review of Acts and you'll see them. Understand what the faith is. Understand what the faith is. It is that which brings redemption and it is that which we live. Amen. Like you started the service by singing, I want to follow in all of your ways. Amen. Seek him. Nobody seeks after him apart from having him in him. But when he is in you, now you seek him. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Yes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness to us. Thank you for revealing these things to us. Help us to learn from your word and to grow in our faith. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know it's late, but we're singing. Take your hymnals out, please. And let's all stand up. Fanny, come on up here. Singers, if you're here, come on up here, please. What is that, 349 up there? I think that's trust and obey. Is that right? All right, come on up here. We're going to sing Trust and Obey, 349, everybody.
shall we sing together? Support with your giving the work of this church, the work of this ministry. And thank you very much for that. The other thing is also right above that box back there, in fact, is uh, the, the sheet, the reservation sheet on the uh, bulletin board for the after church luncheon we're going to have in two weeks. Really, please, dear brothers and sisters, 
just, just decide now, commit now. You're gonna just, it's not anything long. The whole thing might not even be an hour long. Well, it's just as long as you make it. If you wanna stay, if you wanna stay for half an hour, just stay for half an hour and go home. There's no formal activities in it. Just go downstairs, have some fellowship, and eat some food that the church provides. That's all you gotta do. Just come to church and then stay for a few minutes, go downstairs. It would very much help us if you would let us know that you're coming and how many people are in your party. So please, on the bulletin board, would you attend to that before you go home? I know April would appreciate it, the deacons would appreciate it, so would I, that'd be very helpful. Thank you everybody for being here today. God bless you. Deacon Chris, would you close our service with a prayer?